Yeah. Yeah, begun. Right, so thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. As I say, after a bank holiday, Tuesday afternoon, a um, bit miserable outside, not necessarily the best kind of day to be staying at school or having to do something like this, but I do appreciate you being here. The LEP and I spoke to one another um, over the course of the, a few months, basically, in terms of what we could do in order to support the, the careers leaders in Lincolnshire and the careers coordinators in Lincolnshire. Um, you may know, as I introduced myself at that, that previous um, talk we attended, but... Um, you know, we're very much complete careers interested in, in, in improving um, careers provision across the country, but also particularly as Lincolnshire is our home area across Lincolnshire. That's really important for us. So whereas we are working as a, as a company, um, you know, we're very keen as well just to, to support schools and, and make sure the provision is as good as possible. You'll find that when you work with careers professionals, you know, across the board, that that is why they got into, into the role in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you now and bring up the presentation and we'll get started. There are going to be elements of this presentation that um, ideally I'd like some feedback from you, but if you can just pop those in the chat, I'll let you know when that's appropriate. Um, and so we can get a little bit of a sense, and I can get a bit of a sense of kind of what's going on um, from your side of things as well. Um, here we go. So Alex, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see this now? Sorry, go back a stage. Lovely. Okay. So the role of the careers leader. Um, this is me, this is my contact details. If you want to contact me at all about as an informal chat about your provision or about any of the services that Complete Careers offers, please, please do so. Um, you know, we are, we are, as I said, very willing and able to support schools in any way that we can. So, learning outcomes of the session. I'm finding it very difficult to write these. I'm not a teacher by background. My background is, is, is careers guidance. And to give you a bit of an introduction to myself, I'm a careers guidance practitioner. Um, I've got the level seven qualifier qualification in careers guidance. I worked in HE before then moving um, to be head of careers at Lincoln Minster School, so a private school there. And now I work for Complete Careers for the last few years, um, basically as an assessor for the Quality and Careers Standard Award. So I spend a lot of time speaking to schools across the country about their careers provision and assessing them against the standards that we've got. So that is the main part of my role. Um, so I'm used to kind of understanding what careers looks like across the country, what good careers looks like and, and, and pitfalls, areas where schools are struggling to, 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 to maintain the standards as high as they could perhaps do. Um, so I'm still offering guidance. I still go into schools across Lincolnshire offering one-to-one -one guidance. So hopefully I'm quite a useful person in this way to kind of talk about the, the, the minute detail of what, you know, what an individual needs, but then also thinking a bigger picture about, about ways in which schools manage their provision. So by the end of this session, that's my long-winded introduction, I'm hoping you've had a recap of the role and the expectations of the careers leader. So this is something that many of you will know a lot about already if you've already done the careers leader training, but it's kind of a refresher for that. And I'm very aware that many of the careers leaders that certainly I'm coming across have not had the training and have perhaps been in post, you know, fairly, fairly, just, just fairly recently. So I will talk about that a little bit more in a moment. I want to be able to share and acknowledge the different challenges of becoming a careers leader and being a careers leader. Uh, and this is a big focus at the moment. There's a, a big national awareness that the role of the careers leader is um, very difficult um has many challenges attached to it i'm going to discuss them and hopefully going to share some of those challenges that you have with me um there's a huge number of of careers careers leaders um you know moving positions and sometimes that's a really positive way the role of the careers leader is seen as potentially a very very good platform to get into other higher higher jobs or move sideways um but it is also something that a lot of people just are handing back because they simply have not got the resources and the capacity to do what is expected of them um the last point there is to feel empowered to say about what you would like ideally to achieve in terms of your CIG provisions. So that's careers, information, education, advice and guidance. So a bit of blue sky thinking what you'd actually like and understand some of the methods that you could you could use to make those happen. So some of those are going to be just quick wins. You could try this. They're going to be tips that I can give you. Some of those are going to be bigger things that are going to involve much more than just just simply you. It's going to be a, a much bigger buy in for the, for the whole school even the academy chain to make those things happen. Okay, the history of the careers leader. So just to recap kind of what the history is of, of, of careers leadership, I was Googling crowns and I thought I can't possibly use the Queen's crown as there's too much thought process in there already. I was thinking about the crown of thorns or I was thinking about the game of thrones throne because the truth is that being a careers leader can sometimes be something that you, a role that you might really have sought that you may have started and absolutely fallen in love with careers or it might be something that you have just been given and feels like a bit of a poison chalice um, and it's worth thinking about the history of this role because 
you know, in a way it didn't exist or certainly not in, in the recognizable way that we're talking about, about it. Um, you know, before 2016, 17, um, careers obviously did take place in schools. They were being led sometimes by someone on the leadership team. Um, but more often than not, it was led by someone who was more like a head of department, a careers coordinator, perhaps even a careers administrator. Um, external guidance was supported by organizations like Connections or the local authority. Um, so this idea of a careers leader is, is fairly new and fairly recent. And, and as with many things, it hasn't been always very well thought through. Certainly the expectations around what should be achieved does not always seem realistic. And then the statutory guidance 2017 came in and talked about the role of the careers leader. And I'm going to be talking to you about that a little bit more. And careers leaders have been offered or, 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 or many of them have been offered careers leader training for the CEC. Um, complete careers is delivered on some of that as well. Um, and then we had the update to the statutory guidance in 2021, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about later on in terms of, of what that, that means for the careers leaders. And then in recent times, certainly even in the last year, I've seen with um, the schools that I'm involved with a rise in the, the MAT careers leader. So the academy itself having a careers leader across the trust and perhaps managing careers from a central point of view. Perhaps even, um, I mean, I'm sure a, a, a trust that is local to Lincolnshire that you all have known are considering having, you know, a main hub that has careers advisors can even go out to different schools. Um, so you could have a, quite a small mat where you can kind of potentially use that expertise quite nicely. Um, larger mats, obviously, it's very, very different. A large mat might be working with 60 careers leaders potentially dotted about in different schools. But this is something that's definitely a, a real development more recently. And it's worth just pausing for a moment, and I do apologise if this is so obvious, but why do successive governments care basically about careers? Why is it seen as being an important agenda item? And it, and it is. Um, and it's because good career support is, is a mechanism for social mobility. So it's the sense that, you know, if, if students are getting good career support, they're being encouraged to be aspirational, they're being encouraged to be proactive, and it's a good um, agent for social mobility. If you think about some of the independent schools historically and the kind of opportunities they were giving young people and the kind of mindset that they were engendering in young people and have been historically, that's often what's got those young people more what we'd call successful outcomes. Now, I'm always very careful when thinking about those kind of words like success and is a value judgment, you know, is high earning being a barrister in London successful? Yes, on one hand, are they happy? That's a bit more complex. But certainly good careers advice is seen as being a mechanism for improved social mobility. And then secondly, the reason that they care is that aligning the supply of labour with the demand for it. So it's an economic factor there. So it's quite obvious to a lot of people that the education system that we currently have does not adequately prepare young people for the workforce. The skills that the students are being taught in school, there is some mirroring in terms of what is needed in the workforce, but it is imperfect. And if you talk to employers, they will very often say, OK, the students haven't got it now. Obviously, we could be talking about hey, the content of a maths lesson, not necessarily adequately supporting them for becoming an engineer. But in terms of careers, we're thinking more in terms of those soft skills. They're maybe not communicating as well as they should be. They're not writing applications at the standard they should do. So good career support is about making sure the supply of labour to the labour market basically is sufficient for the demand for it. It also means in terms of things like careers that people are considering the right kinds of jobs. And you can never really pass a day or so without an article in the newspaper about how, you know, we don't have enough engineers, but we have, I don't know, 8,000 students graduating each year from, say, journalism or media studies courses, for example. So there's this sense, again, that, you know, I think probably, if I'm honest, I think higher education is probably more responsible for or irresponsible for that the jobs that young people want to do aren't necessarily mirrored by the actual jobs that are out there you know the number of 40 year old students I see who want to become vets um, but how many vet places are there for example it's really it's, it's that very very um uh, that very important job that we have of, of advising students about what is what is out there but then in terms of why most individuals care and that's why I've put this differently most people who work in the careers um profession like I do and in a way possibly like you do is we care about individuals can better craft a happy life for themselves it's about individual outcomes that's so what we actually want is young people to be happy we want them to create have an individual benefit to good levels of career support 
So next step is going to talk about the careers leader and I'm going to go back to some of that um, guidance which you've probably read but probably haven't thought about for a great amount of time hopefully because I hope you're getting on with your job but just to refresh it for you now it's important that careers leader is leading the school's career guidance activity this does not mean that they should be delivering all of it they will be responsible for commissioning line managing and persuading many other people to get involved in the delivery of the school's career program now I suppose you may have all read that what, five years ago, four years ago, some of you will have done if you were if you were a careers leader at that point. But in retrospect, when you look back and you think we are meant to be sort of or you're meant to be delivering a programme that, and you're meant to be line managing and persuading others. It's really um, very sort of what's the word optimistic of what the CEC or what, what, the, what the guidance was thinking that things would be like in schools, basically. Sorry, not the CEC, but the, the, um, the DFE. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that we would be, as a careers leader, managing you know, other people in this team. And that's obviously the aim, but we discovered very much in the last four or five years that that is an extremely big challenge. The other statement there is a careers leader needs to have the authority to influence the development of strategy and, and implement the program. Careers leadership is most effective where the careers leader is on the senior leadership team or has a rep clear reporting line to the senior leadership team. He or she should also have a link with the governor and report regularly to the governing body. I mean, I'm an English student by history, so there's so many things I could pick out of that as just being um, perhaps problematic now. Um, so careers leaders being on the senior leadership team um, many of you, maybe many of you are not. And actually, that's a good thing to start putting in chat. Could you just put um, SL in the chat if you're a senior leader or not SL if you're not, just so I can get a, get a sense of who is um, uh, a senior leader and who, who is not of the, of the, the few of you I've got here today. Um, but while that can be very effective, the issue generally, obviously, with that is a senior leadership has many other responsibilities. So is it better to have a careers coordinator at a middle level or is it better to have a senior leadership in charge of careers? Um, we have not really, well, it, in some ways it works well and there's ways, like, thanks Alex for putting that in. So Alex is not senior leadership. Okay, you're an EA, okay, brilliant. Um, not SLT too, okay. That's really interesting. Um, the people I've got here on, none of them are um, senior leaders. Whether that's because they, they feel that they know it and that's why they're not coming along, I don't know. Or whether they are actually um, basically, you know, there's fewer of you. My sense is from, from working for the Quality and Career Standard Award that most people who are heavily involved in careers are not necessarily the careers leader, but we'll talk to you more about that in a moment. Okay, next slide. So examples of what? this looks like so in terms of what a careers leader would do you should be overseeing the CID provision of the school so what is currently going on in terms of careers and you're overseeing that making sure it happens you're line managing other members of staff within the team so you've got perhaps a careers coordinator a careers administrator under you and you're line managing them you're networking and utilizing your connections and um, you're advocating for more and better provision and you're assessing quality using things like compass Ofsted, which you're not so using voluntarily, but they're coming in, or quality and career standard or destination data. But basically, you are involved in assessing how effective the careers programme is and making sure you've got an understanding of what works. Now, I've gone over that quite quickly and it's because much of the presentation is going to be going to a much more detail about how you can do these things. But this is what the overall vision is of what a careers leader should be doing. Okay. So in the guidance that was produced, and one of the documents that I've always found most useful when understanding the role of the careers leader is the document that came out in, I think, 2017, maybe the end of 2017, start of 18, which is the understanding the role of the careers leader. And this document was produced by the CEC and is a really user friendly and and short, mercifully, document which really indicates, you know, different ways in which careers leadership can work within the current the current arrangements that were already in place. And that's what's really, really good about it. And it highlights four different areas there that there should be good leadership going on, there should be management, there should be coordination, and there should be networking. So the role of a careers leader, like we said in that previous statement, is not about necessarily about the doing, it's very much about um, the oversight, the strategy, and that leadership, management, coordination, and networking are the elements that they should be looking at. In that, they also identify these key principles, and much of this presentation is based around these principles, and these are quality assurance, so understanding what is working well in your school, thinking long term, authority, clarity, time and resources, and then 
expertise. So I'm going to come back to those areas later and do some questioning of you around those and to get some ideas about what, what do we think that the CEC and the DfE mean by those different things and what do they mean for you in your school? Okay, I thought I'd just share with you at this point, before we go on to that in more detail, different models of how it can work and how it does work in different schools. So um, I can speak to maps three or four schools a day and they will all have different models. I don't think I've come across two schools that identically manage careers in precisely the same way. And that's just in terms of the people before we even start peeling back the model of how they actually deliver careers and, and information, advice, guidance and education. The one is that the careers coordinator um, is basically a careers leader. So it can be a middle level, um, somebody perhaps like a head of department, head of careers kind of role, and they are basically the de facto careers leader. They might have a careers guidance training, they might have level three training. Um, they're often underpaid, um, it's worth saying, and overworked. Sometimes they've just come from quite a junior position, maybe it's a careers administrator, perhaps they don't even have a, higher, a degree in higher education, but this has been kind of given to them. And over time, they've developed that expertise. These often are the very, very competent individuals who, from my experience, really struggle with a lack of confidence in talking about careers. And as you can imagine, a drawback of their role is they don't necessarily have the authority to make changes. So for them, speaking to a geography head of department about what they do in terms of careers links in their department, or even more so asking them to put things in place would be absolutely impossible for them in terms of their professional role. And um, they would see that as being too big a leap, they simply don't have the authority to do that or feel they do, either the authority of their role or the natural confidence. So the other way we've got is the careers leader who is who is set on SLT, um, but it's sort of a soft touch and they are relying on a competent careers coordinator underneath them. Um, they have or a careers administrator. They may only have an hour or two allocated each week to careers. And one of the schools I work in, this is definitely the model they use. The careers leader does not have a lot of time allocated to careers, but they buy in an awful lot of careers guidance. They get me to do things above and beyond careers guidance. They've got a careers administrator allocated them for 10 hours a week. And because of their position on SLT, they're able to affect some change in terms of, of what goes on interdepartmentally. And they're able to, um, to um, uh, arrange speakers and things like that to come in but they don't have a great deal of time allocated to it but they have the authority to influence the tutor program and they have authority even over the head of sixth form to make sure that what's being done there is, is of a good standard that is a good model I think and it can work very well it relies on a deputy head um, having you know potentially a lot of, of time um, not a lot of time allocation but a lot of, of, of money or allocation in terms of resources um, across the school so another model I see less frequently, but is a careers leader with a heavy touch and a good allocation of time and strong involvement in careers and sometimes even carries out some information and advice sessions. So I think the school that I spoke to who had the best was a school who had a careers leader who was SLT, who had two and a half days a week allocated to careers. Now that is you know is rare I think it's normally counted in terms of hours, but that is one model that obviously does work potentially very, very well. Um, they would have to obviously have within their remit um, other areas that didn't require too much and that they had this real protected time which we're going to touch on later if a careers leader has something like safeguarding as their other remit something like safeguarding obviously as you know is very responsive and reactive and it can explode at different times and so that is perhaps a pairing which is quite often common within careers leadership and I think is a bit of a shame because it will always safeguarding will always trump careers I think in terms of those that that needfulness but if the careers leader's got other areas allocated to them they can manage more effectively then that can work very well um, and then actually number four, which I focused on number one, is that, that head of career, similar to a subject leader within the department. So this is what a lot of independent schools do. And I do think the model works quite well. So you've got head of careers is the same level as a head of history, a head of geography. So they've got a parity with those heads of departments, which is good. But so careers is seen as being a department. So in the same way that departments have to have action plans, they have to quality assure within a department, the careers is its own department. And I think that is a way and it has its own budget. It's a departmental budget. And that is another way that can work quite well. Excuse me. And then finally, the model that is by far and away the best one that works brilliantly. A lot of FE colleges do this. And I have known schools, including my own school that I went to, which now does this, is a team of careers professionals where you have got maybe two advisors full-time working potentially a head of careers that sits above them and a careers administrator or work-related learning 
administrator alongside it. Now, this is very rare, but you do occasionally come across schools who might have three to four people in a team, um, if not more, if they're part time. Extremely rare, but um, wonderful when you see it. So how would you describe your model now? Again, there's so few of you that it might not be worth putting it in chat, but those of you who are careers leaders working in school, think about maybe what your model is like. What would you say it's most like one, two, three, four or five? As I said, every model I see is different, so it's unlikely you're going to fit perfectly into any of those. But if you could pop in the chat a number that you think your provision is most like, that would be really, really helpful. OK, five. You're saying, Alex. Brilliant. Well done, you. Good luck, you. Um, and five. Excellent. OK, so that is great to hear too, Miss Sue. OK. Um, excellent. Um, and I, I want to bear in mind as well, my role is, is supporting schools to, to develop a good careers provision. Schools who are thinking about working towards the quality and career standard. And it's really important to say at that point that um, possibly one. Um, it's really important to say the schools that I come across are already of a high standard to think about working towards the award. They're already the top half or top third of schools. So I'm very aware that there are some schools out there that probably couldn't even identify any of these as really being a model that's being used because so little is being done, unfortunately, within those schools. Thank you for that. OK, so we've got these job roles as well. And this document that I was talking about earlier, the role of the careers leader, clearly gives those uh, those roles i'm not going to speak about them individually too much but you've got the careers leader you've got a careers coordinator you have a careers advisor careers administrator and then through um the cec you've got the careers advisor and the careers coordinator um and sorry enterprise advisor and enterprise coordinator um, and each of those roles is distinct and different and this is something that that, that i struggle with continually is understanding or, or I, I struggle to explain to careers leaders or careers coordinators the fact that these people need to have different sorts of roles, that careers coordinator, careers leader um, role is, is kind of merging a little bit. And in, in the best case scenario, somebody who was a careers coordinator at middle leadership is being promoted to SLT and given some other responsibility, yes, but actually being given power and authority, but having already used the expertise that they've already developed, where it's not working well is someone's being given at a meeting, all right, you're gonna get careers as a career as a SLT, when they've not necessarily got any interest um, in careers as, as, an, as an academic area, basically, as an area of interest. Um, careers advisor thing, I'm sure you're aware, is very distinct, and that's a very much a distinct qualification, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Out of these roles, if you could just pop into the chat, which of those do you not have access to? So do you feel in your organisation there are, perhaps not based on what you gave from your previous answer, but are there any of these figures that you feel you do not have access to. Now, obviously, in terms of enterprise advisor, and enterprise coordinator, Alex and the team there are developing this as we go along. But are there any of those that you kind of wouldn't recognize? For example, is the careers coordinator doing all the ad admin? Do you not have the ability to get a careers advisor in? Okay. Careers administrator. Sue, thank you. Too early to say, that's fine, Lucy. Um, I would say, just to go on that path point, careers administrator is one of the roles that is seem to be shrinking or dissolving, which is, in a way, the most ridiculous role, because if you are, yeah, again, if you are paying for someone to go on careers leadership training, if you're paying for someone to do the um, a careers guidance qualification, if you're employing someone at a certain level, should they be filling in paperwork and producing letters um, it's not necessarily a good use of time. And, and if I think about my old role as a careers coordinator, yeah, careers coordinator at college to do it all. Absolutely. And um, you've got to think about, is it, is it worth having someone who is that well qualified necessarily doing that level of things? And, and I didn't mind doing it. I quite like doing it. But at the same time, I was kind of aware that it just wasn't a good use of my time. And you really have to, with, with so little resourcing available in every level of careers within schools, it's really important to, to advocate for that. And actually, if you can be freed up of careers coordinator, or the careers leader can be freed up and a, um, a careers administrator can be employed and or, you know, a member of the admin team can be allocated five hours a week or 20 hours a year or what have you when when there are periods where letters need sending out or work experience is an issue um, please consider using them okay so i'm going back to those key principles that i talked about earlier we're going to talk about those in a little bit more depth now so those key principles of the careers leader that were identified um quality assurance thinking long term authority clarity time and resources and expertise now, I want to look at those in a little bit more depth now and think about what do they actually mean? 
And I'm a little bit concerned I've missed that slide now. So there may not be one on quality assurance. Just hold on because my paperwork, no, there isn't. Let's go back a slide and talk about quality assurance. And I'll add this in separately. So if we think about quality assurance to start off with, I'm sorry about that. What do we think the CEC was meaning when they talked about the careers leader being responsible for quality assurance? If you could put anything in the chat there, and then I will put notes about what I think they perhaps mean by quality assurance at this point, and also about how I think quality assurance might be changing in schools. So any words that come into your head when you think of quality assurance in the role of the careers leader, please pop them in. Now, I don't want to steal anyone's ideas. So I don't want to get started talking yet, but um, obviously a large part of my role is around quality assurance. Okay, brilliant. Okay. So how we record our careers programme, Helen, you just put there consistency of what we are, of how we offer it. So yeah, when we talk about quality there, I like the fact that that's the first thing that's actually come in, is actually, is the provision quality? Is it consistently being delivered? That's one of the major things that we need to look at. And it is not always consistently being delivered. And one of the major factors we have. So even before you've thought about anything else that anyone else has put later down in the chat and things that might spring to mind more in terms of quality assurance, you're right. Is it actually being done? Is what we want to be delivered being delivered? And then Alex, very good. I think have the students got access to career support? So is that access being given to career support? Is it of a good quality as well? I'm amazed at the amount of money that schools will spend on careers advice and guidance, huge sums of money really, without even checking or doing any quality assurance about how effective it is. So are the students getting access to the right kind of career support? And is it of, an, is it of a good quality? You know, are you, because as is with everything, teaching, for example, the quality quality of, of, of any interaction is very much is varied um, and then we've got soon meeting the guidance knowing what the guidance is from the from the DfE and then hitting those benchmarks and we know that one of the main reasons way to hit those benchmarks is, is obviously through your compass or through compass plus knowing you've hit them sorry knowing you've hit them is through that but actually thinking about the ways in which you can be hitting them um, so yep CIG Gatsby measures compass absolutely and evaluation as Alex puts there how are you evaluating different interactions that are happening and how really importantly I believe how are you balancing that um, evaluation with um, delivery because I think sometimes unfortunately the emphasis is so much on evaluation at times that we lose perspective evaluation is something that should ideally happen it needs to happen but it should always be a kind of 90 10 in terms of actual delivery in the first place my concern sometimes is that particularly careers leaders can be very very focused on evaluation and not actually focused on enough on initiating things to actually happen in school which let's face it is the point um but integrated into the curriculum and buy-in from peers alex that's brilliant yeah absolutely how can we how can we quality sure that that is happening how can we make sure that those careers across the curriculum is happening and my final session with you guys is going to be on gats before so i won't talk too much about that but that's obviously very important so moving on now to what does it mean to think long term so I love this phrase they've put in here like you need to think long term I mean like everyone can think long term what does it actually mean what does it actually want us to do so when they when you think the CUC is talking about you thinking long term what do you think they're wanting you to be exploring and looking at when they're saying think long term any pop any words into the chat that you think they mean when they're using that statement Now, I found this a really kind of surprising wording when I found it today. I have read the document, but sometimes, again, it's only like being an English student. When you actually start picking out the individual words that you think, OK, what does this actually mean? OK, so we've got future there. Absolutely. What are the futures of the students? What future destinations are they going to go on to do? Exactly. Sue's popped it up there just as I said it. Destinations and futures. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about careers. Um, uh, leaders having to look at destination data in order to understand what's working and what's happening long term with their students and obviously there's this pressure now which I'm going to talk about in, in, in the session on Gatsby 1 about destination data for three years up to leaving but I felt like the way that Lucy's put that in their learning from alumni in impacts in a more in a more nuanced sense because destination data is just data it's not always the best way of getting a sense of what's working and what's not um, it's important to consider things like okay your students are all going on to 
for example, a course in criminology at university, they all seem to be fine, they're all going on, but then are they getting the jobs afterwards? Well, it's unlikely we're ever going to find that out for each individual student, nor should you ever be expected to. But are you keeping up to trend with what's going on in the labour market? Do you have an understanding of some of the longer term outcomes for your students? You know, even if it's just a handful, what are they doing at 22? What are they doing at 23? But it's also about long term planning of your provision. So, um, depending on where you are in your Ofsted cycle, this might be easier or harder to do. And the next session is going to be on Ofsted. But actually, not just thinking about, OK, what's going to look good in the next few months for Ofsted inspectors who might be coming in? But OK, what do I want the careers provision to look like in two years or five years time? Very few schools um, at this point, or certainly three, four, five years ago, had a very good, strong careers provision. Those that have done well have thought of a very, very long term strategy to make that happen. And bit by bit, that's paid off. Bit by bit, they've got the right people in place. They've got a bigger budget allocation. Bit by bit, they've embedded things within departments which work and they've won over heads of department to deliver more. It's very much a, a slow process. And don't be frightened to think long term for your provision. But then, as you say, significantly long term for your learners. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I can't believe how many times I've said I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I am. Um, what does it mean to think long term? Can you think of an example of needing authority as a careers leader now? So authority is something which, and leadership is something which is stressed across all the documentation. But can you think of an example of when as a careers leader, or perhaps even if you are, if you are a coordinator, a time when you could have done with more authority or when you think, actually, um, I needed to be authoritative in that moment? Um, towards other people. Can you give me an example of that? That might take a little bit more writing and thought for me in the chat. You can write something very, very brief if you want. Um, I can think of examples, um, as I said to you before, when I speak with careers leaders and they are careers coordinators who are de facto careers leaders, where they do not feel that they have the authority to do certain things. Um, can you give me examples of the kinds of things that, that that might be an issue with? Please pop them in the chat. Alex, you might have to help if everyone's having a real block. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. We've got one. Brilliant. Destination's ability to persuade SLT and HODS to make cross curricular. Absolutely, Sue. If I had to pick up on one, that would be, sorry, pardon me, that would be the main one that I would identify as well as being a really big issue. Um, you know, ask, careers cannot be one person's even one person's responsibility, I don't even like the word, the fact that careers has got one responsibility for careers across the school. It's just like we've managed to make that good argument about safeguarding being everyone's responsibility. So we have to think about careers as being everybody's responsibility. But that's a really good example there. How do you get head of geography to, who has got an awful lot of pressure on them in terms of achieving results for their students? That's their measure. That's what they're measuring themselves against. How do you ask them to put into something else in which they're not having to measure themselves for? Absolutely. Um, thought in time, um, sorry, often careers is the afterthought in management meetings, something to authority to allow it to be the starting point of planning. Absolutely. I can't, uh, that, that is really important. And I believe that comes from a really um, systemic issue with people not understanding or valuing careers and what it is in school and how much of an impact it can make. So that's why the schools who are brilliant, quite often the schools um, who are from potentially quite challenging backgrounds, who are brilliant at careers, it is at the heart of their agenda. And so it's never an afterthought. But that is that is rare. That's not very often. Um, time out for year 11 away from English and maths interventions. Absolutely love that, Sue. And I may have said this to you before, but it's one of the things that I often say when I go into schools and talk to talk to, to, to schools that you know students will have 90 maths lessons in their final year at school and they will have one 45 minute careers interview. So when we have to fight for that 45 minutes career interview, there's a problem going on. There's a lack of understanding. When a collapsed timetable day is treated or a collapsed timetable half day for year 10s is treated like a big issue, we have to look at something's not working there again. Um, absolutely, having the authority to say this is important. And yeah. when I went into the school I'm currently working in, or one of the schools I'm currently working for guidance, I said that to the teacher, to the head of um, the careers leader, sorry, I said, what about students missing lessons? Is that a problem? He says, that is not a problem here. Careers are seen as being the priority. This, this takes um, precedence over everything else. And interestingly, that's a very academic school. That's a grammar school. Perhaps they've got, they know that their students will catch up with their lessons and they have sort of more faith in that. And I'd say at the other end of the spectrum where schools are really challenging, perhaps often careers is really, really 
really highly valued and it's and it's and it's role in improving attainment is understood and it might but a lot of those schools in the middle there's, there's a struggle there yeah. excellent example. thank you very just much. thought it'd be worth adding a bit on that as well if major and it's yeah, please, i please. think it, it kind of comes back to your last point about not trying to to do too much and, and move things too quickly and, and think longer term it, it does take time to kind of kind of allow you to start making you know some of those decisions i think and it's it's trying to find little ways that you can kind of almost gain more authority and, and gain more traction with it and yeah uh, we, i haven't touched on it yet but someone like trying to find a, a governor that's on your side that you can mm -hmm. kind of bring under your your wing without potentially allowing them to be influenced too much by other other kind of areas of the school might be quite a good um positive one yeah. there's a school that i'm working with at the moment that actually we're making some really good traction there and getting a governor on board and on your team as such is is quite a powerful way to get things moving forward at a, a slightly quicker pace yeah that's actually a good point i do talk a, bit, a little bit about that later you're right sometimes you don't necessarily have the authority yourself in your role so either your role can change or as alex says you can use other people's authority basically borrow some of their authority whether if you've got a good slt line manager obviously that is that is easily done but it could be a link governor i'm going to give you another idea about how you can do that as well a bit later on and then what is meant by clarity i find this really um, a strange word that they've used but i kind of um in fact i, I probably won't go to, to, to ask you oh no i will i'll ask you what do you think they mean by clarity when they talk about that in, um, in this document what the, the careers leader is meant to have clarity there's no right or wrong answer to this because i had to interpret what they meant by this so i'm not entirely sure i have their meaning correct pop it into the chat if you can i think this is Be quite a useful one to see what you think they mean by clarity and compare it to what I discovered. Okay, let's have a little look. Right, a clear vision, goals, aspiration, a plan, a focus, and aim. Brilliant. So yeah, you've put there a clarity about a purpose, I guess, haven't you? Which I think is really, really good. It's not necessarily, it was one of the points I got, but it's not necessarily what I necessarily thought. Um, uh, what have we got here? What, what the programme actually means, how we actually do it. Absolutely clear over your whole school and your group activities. I think that's really clear. What is actually being done, that like the careers programme in some schools is very woolly and vague. And you think you don't actually read it as an external person and get a sense of actually what is being done. What do you actually mean? It's very frustrating. So yeah, clarity should be about what is actually needs to be delivered, what is being delivered. Um, I thought it might be around clarity of their role, clarity of this is my authority, this is what I can do. And I also think there's an important question there in clarity in terms of what they can do and also what they can't do. You know, as a careers leader, you've got to be very, very careful to say, what are your parameters? Okay, I can do these kinds of things. I can lead, I can line manage this person, but I cannot organize work experience for a year group of 250 students. That is not realistic. I cannot offer advice and guidance to learners because I'm not qualified to do that. So it's about clarity of role, but clarity of purpose in terms of the careers programme. Excellent, you've said that much better than me. And then the other area they look at, of course, and probably the most controversial one is what time and resources do you need to deliver careers? So I'm trying to think of a good way for you to add something into the chat here. Um, let me think about who, who would write that they need more time to allocate to careers. So if you think you'd like more time, just put empty or more time allocating to careers there more time than you currently have thank you sue anybody else feels they've got enough time or more time if you could just write it in the chat i think just to while you're putting it in um I think one of the worst schools I came across, the careers leader had one hour of fortnight allocated to careers. And he didn't have a particularly good team under them either. It wasn't like that, it was just a very soft touch, but they had a lot of people under them. Um, and as I said, the best one I came across was I think just under three days a week allocated to careers. So that is a range and they weren't hugely differing sizes of school either. Um, enough, but there's always room for more. What you need, you need amount of time that you need to achieve your goals yeah and then we talk about time not just about time of the careers leader but about time of other people so like i said earlier if you can free up a careers administrator to do part of your role or if you've got a careers advisor coming in to do a big part of your role that that's great so if you think about that time you should be thinking about how you can use it effectively across all the different people that are there and you've got those external people as well which i'm going to touch on a little bit later if you think about things like resources you might be thinking about things like and um, the person in the chat here 
I have 45 minutes for you to take them from not having to do break due to what I want to do, which is roughly three hours a week. All right, Susan, so you massively have your work out for you there. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit more at the end if you've got time, Sue, about your level six qualification. That's really interesting. In terms of resources, it might be like careers advisor, it might be buying in Unifrog, it could be having a budget for speakers, for, for, for not speakers for schools, but other speakers that you might get in. Um, but there are creative ways in which you can do this. And you can think about things, for example, like marketing. If you have a marketing department in your school or a development department, anything like that, a lot of the careers remit can be passed on to them. Again, if we're talking about time, obviously, and there's, a lot, there's more to be said on this, we can be using subject departments to do more of this. It cannot be done by one person singly. It just simply cannot, except in very, very small settings um, when you've got year groups of 40, 50 students. And even then, that's extremely challenging. And what level of expertise is required to be a careers leader? Um, I'm just because we're running out of time a little bit. Networking, very good point you've put in there. I'll come back to that soon. Um, what level of expertise is required to be a careers leader? Now, obviously, you've got the careers leader training, which some of you may have done, some of you may not have done, some of you may be interested in doing. Um, but much of it is going to be self-taught, keeping yourself up to date with the, the latest guidance and latest practice. It's going to be self-reflective. OK, well, what, what do I think I could do to be better? What could I do to make the provision at the school better? But it's also about knowing where your expertise ends and where there are things that you can do, but other people sorry things that you can't do but other people can do and that's really important as well and even coming along to this conference today reaching out to the lap in the ways that you are doing is where you're showing okay I don't necessarily know enough about that these people do and not only are they willing to train me but on occasions they're willing to actually come into my school and deliver training and take that 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 off me okay so this kind of sort of final part of the session, really, I suppose, is what do you want your product to be like? Because if we think about our careers provision, what we mainly need to think is what do we want the young people to be like as they leave our school? I would love to have some of your thoughts on this, but I'm just very aware that we are going to run out of time. I don't want to keep you too long. But I think if you can really visualize that learner and obviously they're all individual, they're all different. and That's what we want them to be. But you want them to have a certain set of characteristics that will allow them to succeed in the future. And if you can crystallize what you want those to be, you can then return to your program, to the support you're offering them and measure that. So I've just done a list here, and this is just the top of my head, the kind of things that I want young people who I come across to be. As a careers advisor, you're seeing students very often at the end of their school process, whether towards the end of year 11 or towards the end of year 13. So careers advisors, if you buy them in already, are very good people to talk to about whether those young people are showing the kind of characteristics that you want. So are they optimistic, proactive? Are they self-aware? Do they know about themselves? Are they aspirational? Do they think, you know, I can do what I want, but are they at the same time realistic? Are they aware of, well, you know, they're not going to be a vet if they're not getting the grades that they need at school. Are they entrepreneurial? And when I mean that, I mean, are they, you know, they may not set up their own business necessarily, but there will be opportunities for them within any organisation they're in to be creative and entrepreneurial. Creative is the next one. Good communicators. No matter whether they need to be a good communicator for their job, they're going to need to be good communicators for their interviews, for their networking. Are they organised? Are they able to set themselves targets? Are they um, LMI, labour market information, or aware? They're the kind of people that are going to research. Are they proactive in terms of researching LMI? Are they socially conscious? Are they caring about their role in society? Ideally, we do want that of them as well. And that they're confident in building relationships and networking. And these are just random ones that I came up with. You could come up with, with many more of what you see you want your learners to be. No matter what academic level that they're achieving, we want those things of the young people that we're dealing with. But again, to go back to that, for a, a one individual to be responsible for every single student in a year groups of 270 to be giving or passing on these qualities, it clearly is the responsibility of a much wider number of people, in fact, the whole school. And I think if we to go back to our point about social mobility there, if we think about traditionally independent schools were better historically, and I'm not saying they necessarily are now, I wouldn't say they necessarily are, but historically were better at giving young people the opportunities to have those kinds of characteristics. 
So that could have been by smaller teaching groups they were getting better communication skills. It could be by a greater range of extracurricular activities. They were being more courageous. Perhaps they're taught to be more aspirational and optimistic. I mean, that's obviously that is not just the nature of the school. That's the nature of the social demographic they might come from. But what I'm seeing now, a definite trend is that some very good state schools with good careers programs and, and, and careers embedded as part of their ideology are managing this very, very well with huge year groups. But it is a real, real challenge. And it's, it's a culture shift, really. And that's, that's something that is, is a big issue. How to get it done. Now, this is my biggest slide and my most major slide and the one I'm going to dwell on. And then we really are almost done, I promise. How do you get it done? This is just a few tips that I'm giving you in terms of what I think works well in different schools. And in the, the following session that you're going to have on Ofsted and the next two that you're going to have delivered by me on um, career um, first gaps for benchmark and the fourth, there will be more details like this. Um, audit what is already in place. Know what's already happening in your school because that's, that's, that's the first starting point. There's more happening than you think. Geography is doing something they're just not telling you about it. Hearts and minds, consider set up CPD. The schools that do careers best are schools where every single member of staff really cares about the future life of their kids. And I don't mean that, you, that maybe some schools don't care, but they, they know that it's an important part of what they're trying to achieve. It's not just about grades. Consider things like staff CPD, which you could deliver. You could get someone like me to deliver. Maybe even your careers advisor would, would be willing to deliver. Um, to make, make um, uh, teachers reflect on, not teachers, pastoral, anybody, or everybody in the school, reflect on their own experience of careers. What is it they wish they'd had? What support did they wish they'd had as a young person? Um, create a team and department. Some of you may have that. Some of you may never be able to do this because the resourcing is not there. But by creating a team, a department, even a physical space, you're giving careers a higher profile within your school. See quality assurance um, and things like the compass um, as an opportunity. I'm putting him, I'm just going to tag you down there. Um, it's an opportunity. Um, be accurate in terms of your compass and be honest. And I know you will be because um, obviously if someone else comes in after you, you know, it has to reflect what is actually in place and see it as an opportunity to advocate for yourself. You know, if, if you're not in good compass scores, then that's a good argument for you to go back to the, the leadership team and say, we're not managing this and this is why. Access the careers leader training. There's advanced careers leader training now, I believe, that's available. Consider whether it's right for you. Depending on your role, you might even want to consider careers guidance training instead, because that might be more helpful for you. Look elsewhere, network with other schools, spend half a day looking at the provision at another school where the provision is good. You know, go on their website, ask if you can have a visit to another school and see how they do careers. Ask your SLT lead or your careers leader to go along with you so you can see how it's done well elsewhere. Name and shame things that aren't being delivered. I would really struggle to do this as a lower level careers coordinator, but I've seen it being done where tutors were basically named and shamed for not delivering careers when they should have been within PSHE. And um, obviously not publicly, but it was identified that careers learning was simply not taking place within those sessions. The teacher was using it understandably to a degree to catch up on things like admin or pastoral concerns, but those kids were missing out. I'm going to have to move you again now. I've not really worked out my toolbar very effectively today to be able to look at all my points. Consider the use of resources such as guidance. The school that I work in, for example, they use me to create newsletters for them. They use me to do assemblies, recorded assemblies for them. Your guidance practitioner, if you buy in one externally, may be willing to do more than simply guidance. They may be willing to do group work, design resources for you, create a bank of resources. If you've got newsletters, they can be recycled every three or four years. Think about ways in which to create that longevity. Advocate for more, consider using quality and careers under a link governor to help you. And this is exactly what Alex was saying now, using things like the quality and careers standard award or your link governor to advocate for more. You know, schools understand the word offset. I bet John's session next week is much more highly attended than mine because let's face it, people care about that. And knowing what your head or your leadership is going to care about, whether that's the perspective of the governor, the perspective of um, a quality and career standard award or, or offset, it's always going to make an impact. Um, uh, uh, what have I got? Name and shame. I've been losing track of what I've done now. Um, here we go. Use frameworks. That's my next one. CDI. I'm using the Narupi framework for something I'm doing currently. Um, you know, use frameworks to help you discover what good careers is, look like if you don't think you know it already. Sit back and think about what your learners need. Depending on where you are on the Ofsted cycle, don't be afraid to take some time out. Work what, what think what works well and plan a longer term strategy. As I was saying earlier. 
Use whole school targets. One of the best years I had in my job as at Lincoln Minster School was when one of the whole school targets was for every department to have a speaker come in. And so basically my job was taking care of me. Careers across the curriculum and external speakers, employers was taking care of me in one swoop because it was put as one of the school development plan. Ask for and use help. And this is my final point, which takes me onto this image here. Of all the different organisations that you can use to help you, you're not alone. And these organisations, the top left one is a printout from the um, print screen from the Facebook Careers Leader page, which if you're not on, I would strongly recommend you to get on. It's very good. Um, these organisations will all help you. They'll provide speakers for you. They'll talk to your learners directly. They'll advocate for you. Um, complete Careers, you know, we do offer services that we can support you with. Just like careers is not the responsibility of one individual within a school, neither is it really the responsibility for a school. It's the responsibility, it's a social responsibility that we have, a wider responsibility. So think about that much more, much more closely. Um, use the help that you can um, and, and, and know that you're not alone, basically, because it is, it is at times a thankless job. Um, I was thinking just before I did this presentation, um, and this is just from the CEC about how they're expanding their enterprise network, but I was thinking of this presentation, a really good quote I heard recently from Leonardo DiCaprio, which was hopefully they remember the film and not the actor. And I think that's very, very true of careers guidance as well. If careers guidance is done effectively and done well, or any career support is done effectively and done well, the, the students probably will not remember the encounter. It will pass away, but they will remember that support. Um, but as I'm going to put in the next slide, um, they will remember um, bad um, guidance. So I just wanted to finally address, and this is a little bit of a, an addition I want to put in here, just because I know a lot of you speaking with schools, particularly in Lincolnshire, are struggling to, to, to source good careers guidance. Um, and it, there are issues around it, such as is careers guidance truly understood? If you don't understand what careers guidance is, I know that may sound obvious, look it up and research it. Go on websites like the CDI, which I put at the end, because it is a skill. It does require training, similar level of training that a teacher would gain and learning how to teach a classroom. We wouldn't expect a, a non-qualified teacher to stand up in front of a class and deliver a, a, a class. We wouldn't expect, therefore, a teacher or an LSA to have a proper guidance session with um, a student is, is, a, is a skill. And is the impact of good careers guidance recognised? Well, not always. Like I say, very often it's about, um, it's, a, it's a slightly thankless role, but if, if done positively and, and done effectively, it can be very effective. Are careers professionals paid appropriately? Um, are careers leaders given enough time to source advisors? And then there is a massive shortage in supply. And whenever I go to a careers leader conference, I'll notice that the demographic is very much um, people, often women in their 50s and 60s who are now retiring. There's very few careers advisors in their 20s and 30s. So this is only going to get worse. And in parts of Lincolnshire South, and I've got my big map behind me, South and, and East of the county, there is a huge shortage. We get asked for schools to provide guidance and we simply have not got anybody to send out there. Some schools are being offered online guidance. Um, by organisations like us. I mean, it's better than nothing, absolutely, but is it what you want? The last point that I'm putting is, you know, people always have got something to say about the job that you do. Like, if you're, if you're a fast jet pilot, people will say to you, I wanted to be a fast jet pilot. Now, everybody says to me, my teacher told me I would never be good enough to do so-and-so, um, join the police, become a vet, do whatever. I was never good enough to do that. Bad careers advice goes a long way. And this is a really important point to make to your staff, to yourself, um, to be done well, guidance or any interaction has to be done quite, quite, um, quite, quite gently. So I said, someone said this to me last week, that the person at my daughter's um, volunteering opportunity, I got told I'd be never good enough to join the police. That person's taken away anger from that person. I mean, they were in their 60s. So they were held onto that information all that time. They felt not good enough. They felt inadequate. Clearly, that person may be very inappropriate to join the police, but how a careers advisor would approach that was saying, OK, so what do you think a police officer has to do? Well, they have to deal with difficult situations. They might say, well, how do you deal with challenging situations? How do you deal with conflict? And then that individual themselves is making that link and realising that they are not appropriate. Not only are they realising it for themselves in a really effective way, but they're not being told they're not good enough to do anything. I've been told so many times, or oh, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I won't name his name because he's working at Lincoln Missile, has told me to do maths A-level because that's a good maths A-level and drama's a rubbish A-level. Well, a good A-level, as we all know, is the one you're most likely to get an A in, not the one you're going to get a D in. So these values that we have as teachers, 
as advisors, I know I've got them as well, you know, as LSAs, whatever, as parents, particularly, they're getting it. It's very much about stripping yourself away from those values and letting learners work it out themselves and nudging them to work it out themselves. If those people were appropriately supported when they were younger, they'd have made the distinction themselves about what they could and couldn't do. And they wouldn't have that anger left over from being told us things they cannot do. So I'm so sorry to have gone on all but one minute left. Sorry, I can go back a slide there. But any questions, I'll leave the links for that. It's probably more helpful for you. If you have got any questions, please do put them in chat. Please demute yourself, if that's a term, and actually just ask them of me now. Um, just to recap, we've got a, a session in a week's um, two or two weeks time on Ofsted, and then a further two sessions with me on um, consecutive weeks, which you'll have in your diary about Gatsby Benchmark One, and then Gatsby Benchmark Four. Anything you've got to ask me or say, please pop it in the chat or, or unmute yourself now. But I couldn't have covered everything, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I will hold on to it in case anything is gonna go into the chat. Thank you so much for, for being around. And um, I really hope it was semi-useful for you to kind of review that role of a careers leader and think about it again, and refresh yourself on it. Um, I've got a couple of bits in the chat here. Um, thank you so much. Very helpful. Thanks very much. Um, brilliant. Sue and Heloise. Thank you. I'm glad that was useful for you. And please just say do come along and urge of the schools to come along to those other sessions uh, and make contact with you directly if you've got any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's great. I'm going to stop recording now. Brilliant. I've stopped there and I'm stopping.